For our experts in emotion interview, we have the honor of speaking with Dr. Leah Somerville on emotion in adolescence. So Dr. Somerville is an assistant professor of psychology at Harvard University. She received her PhD from Dartmouth College where she examined how individual differences in anxiety influence the physiological and neural processing of threatening and unpredictable information. She then completed her postdoctoral training at the Sackler Institute for Developmental Psycho Psychobiology at the Weill Cornell Medical College. Currently, work in the Affective Neuroscience and Development Lab, which she directs, is focused on the unique relationships between brain development and everyday behavior, as both are changing during the adolescent years. Heavily influenced by her experiences working in the Teen Crisis Center, a long-term objective of her lab is to inform a potential linkage between adolescent-specific emotional changes, brain functioning, and the tendency for psychiatric illness and suboptimal decisions to emerge during the second decade of life. She's also teaming up with Boston area middle schools and high schools to conduct outreach activities focused on getting adolescents excited about science. And most notably, Dr. Somerville's first job was as a waitress in a greasy spoon diner. So with that, I now turn to our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Leah Somerville. So welcome, Leah. Thanks for speaking with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. What I wanted to start out with asking about is a little about your journey into the world of emotion. So what first kind of sparked your attention and got you interested in this topic? Sure. Um, well, I got interested in emotion, I think, right at the beginning of my college years. Um, I thought that um, I would probably end up as a psych major even going into college, um, but what I wanted to really gain was experience working in laboratory settings. Um, so I ended up uh, working in two different labs um, early on in my college years, both of which approached the study of emotion in very different ways. So I worked in one lab that was um, looking at cognitive biases in clinical depression. So looking at um, emotional sort of processes from a clinical perspective. And then on the other hand, I was working as well in a neuroscience lab that was trying to really pinpoint the role of a subcortical part of the brain, the amygdala, in sort of detecting and assigning relevance to cues in the environment. So these two research experiences, although they were really different, um, sort of had a common thread of emotion in them, and I think that it kind of hooked me, and then I was, there was no turning back from there. <laughs> so now you're hooked and stuck forever. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> so I want to then ask you a little bit about, since you've been hooked, kind of what you've been doing research-wise, because um, you're doing some really exciting work. Um, so one of the questions I wanted to ask you about is, I mean, you've really conducted fascinating research using these tools in neuroscience to better understand the way that the brain develops and shapes our emotional experiences sort of from childhood into adulthood. And I'd love to hear your perspective on what you think some of the most interesting and exciting discoveries are here. Sure. Um, I think the, the main discovery that I um, am very excited to have had a chance to work on is not necessarily my own, but one that's been sort of developing and changing over the last even, let's say, decade, um, which is the idea that part of the reason why adolescents may behave in unique ways in terms of their emotional lives and experiences um, may in fact be due to the way that, in part, by, to the way that the brain develops. So um, typically, adolescents are thought of as having a sort of unique profile of emotional experiences. So one could say that they're oriented toward rewards, which leads them to take risks. Um, people could consider them as moody or more volatile in their emotional reactions, and there is some data supporting this characterization. Um, however, people have used and classically used these characterizations as, as seeing some sort of negative and um, almost you know, unfortunate things about adolescents. Um, some people have characterized them as being in a state of temporary insanity or that they're unable to control themselves and saying things um, along those lines. Um, however, in the last 10 years, uh, brain imaging has allowed us to uh, pinpoint that, in fact, um, trajectories and ways in which the brain develops during the second decade of life may, in fact, lead adolescents to be more susceptible to the influence of emotion on their day-to-day -day behavior. And this, in, this might change or reframe the way we can think about adolescence um, as a way from a sort of deficient period of the lifespan and toward thinking of this as a very normative and almost um, sort of uh, mediated by, by typical developmental trajectories of the brain. Hmm. So right, so you study this, this period of adolescence, which is such a unique and memorable time in everyone's life. 
but at the same hand, on the same hand, like what you're saying is it's described as this period people say of like storm and stress, right? With all gas and no brakes, for example. And I mean, from your perspective then, I mean, as an expert in really studying the emotional lives of adolescents and the sort of neural bases, why have you found this group such a particularly interesting population to work with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really interesting question because, um, as you know, I'm not a developmental psychologist. In other words, I didn't enter into psychology wanting to, um, you know, pick apart aspects of human development. Um, but I've gotten really, really interested in adolescents, even in the last five years, um, because they offer the, a really unique tool or a really unique sort of lens to understand basic emotion. So what I mean by that is that adolescence really is a time where we see a lot of changes in the way that people experience emotion, um, both in their daily lives as well as things we can evoke in the lab. Um, so adolescence um, is a period of life that is, is sort of characterized by um, emotions that are um, not, uh, that are similar sort of qualitatively to other periods of the lifespan, but they might be sort of dialed up in their extremity. So the um, adolescents tend to experience more frequent, both positive and negative emotions. And when they experience them, they tend to experience them as sort of heightened uh, state of, of extremity. Um, and this is also a period of life where um, there tends to be a common onset of psychopathology. So relative to childhood as well as adulthood, um, mood and anxiety disorders in particular tend to emerge during adolescence um, in their sort of initial onset. So um, the way I think of adolescence is a really unique period of the lifespan where we can um, track a couple of things. One is these common and typical changes in the way that emotions are experienced. And then we can relate them to ways in which the brain may be behaving or functioning uniquely during this time of life. And so this can tell us both about sort of basic aspects that link emotion experiences to uh, brain functioning, as well as sort of in um, give us a lens to really zoom in on this really particularly interesting period of life. It's fascinating. Not only are you studying emotions, you know, in sort of healthy adolescents, but your work has also explored really important clinical implications for when emotion goes awry with a focus on anxiety. And I wondered if you could just elaborate a bit on how your brain imaging work on anxiety can help us understand, you know, emotion more generally. Sure. Um, yeah, this is, you're referring to as work that I really got interested in during graduate school. Um, and based on reading a great deal about, um, you know, the brain and neural bases of emotion, one thing that I noticed was that most of the studies that study emotion in the lab tend to use a, a procedure where emotions would be evoked using some sort of cue in the environment. And then we would measure sort of brief response to that cue. Um, but we know that in our everyday lives and in the real world, emotions don't necessarily play out over these very brief uh, sort of reactive timescales. And so what we wanted to do um, in this work was to try and provide new tools and new ways to try and understand how emotion might be maintained over time. And this would be um, sort of trying to understand how sustained emotion may be sort of held onto, if you will, by circuitries of the brain. And with this work, we actually identified some interesting distinctions between the brain circuitries that can sort of evoke and assign significance to emotional cues um, relative to those that actually remain persistently active that could hold on to, let's say, an anxious state for minutes at a time. And so um, one of the things I think is cool about this work is that it might provide us new avenues to try and understand emotion maintenance in the lab, which is not a simple thing to do, um, but it may have relevance to a number of different sort of clinical uh, disorders that are particularly those that are marked by sort of hyper arousal that maintains over time or disorders of rumination where um, worrying or other kinds of mood states might be maintained over time. And so we're hoping through um, future studies and some current studies that I'm working on to apply these ideas to try and um, ask the question of whether um, these sustained emotion systems may in fact also have a prominent role in the pathophysiology of anxiety disorders. And do you think from this, I mean, that's just such interesting work, do you think there might be particular implications for understanding anxiety in adolescence that's unique or different from adults? Yes, um, I think so. So one of the interesting features of the emergence of anxiety disorders is that 
certain anxiety disorders um, based on epidemiological work um, tend to emerge relatively early in the lifespan. And these are, have sometimes been referred to as fear disorders. That is, those that are marked by extreme reactions to some sort of environmental cue. Um, but disorders of the um, anxiety disorders that are more characterized by these sort of lengthy states of rumination or worry um, tend to initially present themselves during the adolescent years. And so one thing we're testing right now is whether brain properties of brain development in the circuitries that I sort of mentioned earlier may in fact be distinct um, and potentially sped up in path and in um, anxious adolescents who tend to have this sort of worry-like profile. And this is something that we are um, examining right now through some clinical studies with some collaborators that I have um, in New York. So stay tuned. <laughs> Very exciting. I can't wait to hear. <laughs> so then, you know, as you're thinking about the work that you've been doing and what got you first hooked into the study of emotion, when you sort of like look forward into the future, where do you see the field headed? Mm -hmm. I think that um, even in the last 10 years, um, I'm trying to understand the sort of neural bases and underpinnings of our emotional experiences has really um, transformed. I mean, this is a field that's rapidly evolving. And I think we're getting a better and better handle on some of these basic functional aspects of different circuitries in the brain that may mediate um, emotional experiences and regulation of emotion. Um, I think what a lot of people are working towards now is to try and use that information to help inform um, sources of risk as well as sources of resilience for psychopathology. So to try to translate um, this, these basic findings into a more sort of clinically relevant way, uh, cl clinically relevant context, um, which may in fact help us to um, say something really important about the sources of, um, sources of variability, sources of risk and resilience uh, relevant to psychopathology. And so when you talk then to students who are asking you not only where is the face of the future headed, but what advice would you have for them as they think about embarking into this field, what, what sorts of things do you say to them? What do you think are sort of important kernels of, of wisdom to take as, as someone thinks about getting into this field and getting hooked? <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I think that one important thing to consider um, is that being an active sort of participant in um, working in research laboratories uh, really provides insight into how emotion and emotion research works that you can't really get from a textbook or from a, sitting in a classroom. And I, so I would encourage people who might think that they're interested in this field to really get their feet wet and try out a number of different experiences working in laboratory settings um, and potentially working in a broad array of them to really try and hone in on the particular interest areas that you have. Um, the other thing I would mention is that, um, although we don't hear about it as much these days, um, some of the, the very classic and really fundamental things we understand about emotions have in fact been derived uh, through the use of animal models. And I think that um, as a student, I was um, really encouraged to do a lot of reading on these very basic and fundamental findings that uh, may diverge from sort of um, human emotional experiences, but really provided the basis and foundation upon which uh, the field of emotion has been able to build um, into studying, you know, all the way up to human emotion and psychopathology. So I would also encourage students to really um, go back in time and, um, and read and really make sense of some of these very fundamental findings that have shaped the field. Great. Thank you so much for speaking with us today, Leah. It was great to talk to you. Thank you. It was fun. Thanks. And this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Leah Somerville from Harvard University.